Uh, teach something biblical, nothing learned, nothing gained. And what we mean by that is, is that your sermons should have some educational component. Okay? Your sermon should have some educational component. They shouldn't just be rah-rah messages. We can do it. We can really be holy. We can do it. And we can witness. And yeah! I mean, there's nothing wrong with preaching a rah-rah sermon and getting up with your pom-poms. But, but your, your sermon should have something of substance. There should be some educational component. I should learn something from your sermon. Teach me something. In this last sermon that Brian just preached on Sabbath, a brilliant sermon, I learned several things in that sermon. I, in fact, I learned tons of stuff in that sermon. He taught me. He taught me. He taught me about the, the origin of that phrase there in Revelation chapter 3, a true and faithful witness. He showed me the historical context of that in the, in the ministry of Jeremiah and the remnant and the unbelief of the remnant. He showed me that, that the command was so simple. To me, the strongest point, many of you might remember this, to me, the strongest point of Brian's sermon, I, uh, there were so many excellent points, but I loved it when he said that the message, he, he read all the text and then he basically said, the message to the remnant was, stay put. And then he said, and this is a great example of how a simple illustration can make the whole thing come home. He said, we teach this to our dogs. Do you remember him saying that? He said, even a dog can get that. Stay. And the moment he said that, I thought, that is so true. God, how brilliant was that of God, basically to say, because the people are like, whatever it is, we'll do it. And God's like, okay, just stay there. Did anybody else, did that, did that resonate with you? I, I just, that was it. It just came home. It was right there in front of me. So, so was the sermon inspiring? Yes. Was it, edu was, it, was it encouraging? Yes. But was it educational? Yes. I learned something in that sermon. Okay. So nothing wrong with a rah-rah sermon, but you don't want your sermons to be like tea. Okay? Tea. No tea. And the reason is, tea is hot, but it's not nourishing. <laughs> so, you might stand up and preach it with all of the enthusiasm and gusto and, 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 you know, charisma that you can muster, but if there's not something of substance, your sermon's just like tea, right? It's hot, and it's well-delivered, and brothers and sisters, and all of that, you know, you can dress it up however you want, but at the end of the day, I want to ask, my, I want to ask myself the question when I hear a sermon, what did I learn? And if all I learned was that the preacher... Um, is a very good communicator. I didn't learn anything biblical. Okay, that the preacher can string together nice religious platitudes. I didn't learn anything. That the preacher's good at yelling or good at screaming or good at running around or good at telling stories. I, what did I learn from Scripture? Okay, so strive to have your sermons be unlike tea. You know, just because you deliver it well and you deliver it hot with lots of passion, if there's no calories, you're not going to live very long on tea. Make your sermon more like bread. Make your sermon more like bread, something of substance. Okay? And a word about bread. How do you eat bread when you eat bread? Usually. When you eat, yeah, peanut butter and jelly. So typically when you eat bread, in what form do you eat it? You eat a slice at a time. A slice is an appropriate size, uh, and it's, 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 it works great. A slice of bread is just... It's, it's great because it's thin, it's well-defined, it's not too much, it's not too little. Your sermon should be like sl a slice or slices of bread, not crumbs, okay? Not, very few of us would ever take a loaf of bread and, and then just like start breaking it up into little crumbs onto our plate and eat it that way. And that'd be a really weird way to eat bread. It would be wasteful, you couldn't spread anything on it, it would be inefficient. Okay, but many sermons are like crumbs. If somebody says, oh, what was the sermon about today? A little of everything. Have you ever heard one of those sermons? Yeah. It's about a little of everything. It's about the state of the dead. It's about healthful living. It's about giving life over to Jesus. It's about the soon second coming. It's about, it's about uh, uh, everything. Oh, the sermon's about everything. What did the preacher preach on? Yes. Right? That's crumbs. That's just like the preacher's just, he's just spreading crumbs, and hopefully somebody picks up something. No, 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 no. Your sermon should be a well-defined piece of digestible. It should be well-defined and something that you can give to somebody and is not too much. It's not a loaf, and it's not a crumb, and it's not scattered. It's well-defined, and it's placed in front of them, little toast, little jam, whatever it is. Make sense? Okay? And, and bread has nourishment. 
well-defined. We together, everyone, on that? So teach something biblical. If your sermon does not have an educational component, then it's not, it's, it has failed. It has failed. Um, apply your points to real life. We've talked about this, the practical aspect. Uh, listen to this here. Um, Ellen White writes in Review and Herald, April 23rd, 1908, it is harder to reach the hearts of men today than it was 20 years ago. <laughs> you just have to laugh. You just have to like, wow. So she's writing in 1908, and she says it is harder to reach the hearts of men today than it was 20 years ago. Man, I tell you, back in 1888, we had it easy. But now, 1908, with all this technology, whoo, can't even keep up with it. The most convincing arguments may be presented, and yet sinners seem as far from salvation as ever. Ministers should not preach sermon after sermon on doctrinal subjects alone. Question, should they preach on doctrinal subjects? Yes. But should they preach on doctrinal subjects alone? You're getting it. Practical godliness should find a place in every discourse. In other words, if you don't have feet on your faith and legs on your lessons, if it doesn't land in the bedroom or the boardroom or the living room or the, if it doesn't land in the workplace in real life, who cares? It's not going to be scratching where most people are itching. Most people want to know, how do I take this ancient book and make application today? How do I take this sermon and make application today? That's where most sermons fail, right there, is in the practical application. Leslie. No, this is an example of uh, practice. So, so uh, yeah, we're going to come to that. Oh, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. I apologize for that. I know it's. I need to remedy this. You can have these slides. Yeah. If, if what I'll do is I'll give these to who can I appoint? That would be. Oh, I'll put it on the computer in the lounge. I'll put it on both PowerPoint and Keynote. Great. Yeah, I'll do that. I apologize for this being difficult to read here. Uh, Signs of the Times, March 16th, 1882. A constant effort to promote personal piety should be seen in the minister's public labors. <coughs> sermon after sermon should not be given on the Prophecy. prophecies alone. Question, should we preach sermons on the prophecies? Yeah. But not on the prophecies. <laughs> Practical religion should have a place in? Every. Do you see what she's saying? She's saying not every sermon is on doctrinal subjects. And not every sermon is on the prophecies, but I'll tell you what is in every sermon. Practics. Every sermon should be practical. Practical application to the modern life. For her, that was 1908. For us, it's 2000, almost 2011. Okay? Practics. Okay, so that's us here. Apply your principles to real life. Practice difficult names beforehand. This is a very common mistake. In fact, I love Brian, and his sermon was great, but I'm not so sure he was pronouncing... Gedalia correctly. I think it would be Gedaliah. Did anybody else pick up on that when he was telling his story? Most people wouldn't. But, but to Brian's credit, maybe he looked it up. I mean, he's been to school. I haven't even been to school. But I would have think it would be Gedaliah, not Gedalia. But that's not even the best example. The best example is when someone comes across a verse that has a name in it that they did not practice and read beforehand, and it is a very quick way to have your audience and your congregation lose confidence in anything else you have to say. Now, for better or for worse, I'm not saying it's right, but the truth of the matter is, is if your doctor <laughs> stood up in front of you, you know, and, and you were going to have brain surgery, and he's like, and then what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go into this um, hypothalam, hyp <laughs> we're going to go into this part of the brain. <laughs> and you'd be like, what? <laughs> no, you, you wouldn't. You expect someone to know their profession, okay? So if you're standing up and you've chosen, if, you, if you're going to preach on the 70-week prophecy and you've chosen to read Luke chapter 3, verse 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of the Lord came to Zacharias, uh, John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. You better know those words. Right? If you get up there and you're like, now in the 15th year of the reign of Ti Ti Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of I Ituri, and the region of 
Trachinidus and Lysinus Tetrarch of Abilene. I mean, people are like, <laughs> and I'm supposed to take anything else that you have to say seriously? Okay, so if you are going to use a verse, make sure that you know how to pronounce the difficult names and the difficult words in that verse. Also, if you're asked to do a scripture reading, practice it beforehand. I'm just talking about for scripture reading for church. So you don't get up there and bumble through and basically tell people that you don't take the word of God seriously and that they shouldn't either. When the scripture readings are done in our church, they should be done with power. They should be done with compassion. They should be done with accuracy. Amen? So just a very simple little thing. Practice those difficult names beforehand. Chris? Um, when did the practical thing that Mario asked yeah. you to put in yeah. Like I didn't even knew how to pronounce it. I could only read it. Yeah. Until I actually listened to it. So brilliant. Audio Bible, and then I just sang it. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. An audio Bible is a great thing to have. I have one on my iPod. Yeah. Yeah. Very good idea. And then go find that and listen to how Alexander Scurby pronounces it or whoever, you know, just go listen. Very good point. In fact, there, even just difficult words. I'll tell you a cute little story about my own, my experience. Ha! It's just funny how you can just get into the habit of pronouncing a word wrong. And for the longest time, what was that word, man? Oh, yeah, shame on me. So I'm preaching, and I don't even use this word anymore, but I was preaching, and I kept talking about a shimmera, a shimmera, a shimmera. You know, a shimmera. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I'm preaching, and I'm just, in my sermons, I would end up talking about this, the, the shimmera, and it would come up in various contexts. And my friend Justin Kim comes, and he's like, hey, uh, really enjoyed that sermon. Just a heads up, <laughs> that word is pronounced chimera. I'm like, no, it's not. Shimmera. He's like, no, it's not. So I, I, I timidly went to the you know, online audio dictionary or whatever, typed it in, chimera. So then I like wanted to go back every sermon I ever used that word and like delete, delete, delete. Anyway, the point is, is that don't assume. I mean, I've done that. Don't assume. You know, it's a very good idea to use an audio Bible or especially if you come across a word that you're not quite sure how it's pronounced. Now, listen, it's not that big of a deal. But the truth of the matter is, is that many people, and, and I'm sure that truly educated people wouldn't be offended at me saying this, some educated people, not all, but some of them are highfalutin. And they are looking for a reason to write off someone who doesn't have their same level of education. Okay? And those kinds of people, now that's not all educated people. In fact, it's not even most educated people. Many people are very humble and, and of course, both educated and uneducated. But if you come across somebody who is highfalutin and they're looking for a reason, maybe not intentionally, but, but the moment you say something wrong, they've written you off, don't give them unnecessary reason to write you off. Try to be an effective communicator. Okay, a friend of mine, not a super close friend, but I heard a fellow preach a sermon one time. He was standing up, preaching his heart out, trying to get the church rallied up for evangelistic meetings. And he's like, and, and it's not always the smart people that know what's going on. Some of you have your PhDs, permanent head damage. <laughs> and I was just like, w what, are you tr what are you doing? Like, have you lost your mind? I mean, d d d should somebody be chastised because they're educated? No. But, but the fact, when you, the moment you do that, you unnecessarily and rightfully prejudice people against you. You sound like an idiot. You know, there's no need. We shouldn't castigate people for being educated any more than we should castigate them for being uneducated. Making sense? What we should